Hello, I'm Marissa Schaefer. And I'm Jenna Cantor, and welcome to Physiotherapy Performance Perspectives, a physical therapy podcast for performing artists. Today, we are interviewing Gina Pongetti, who is joining us on the phone from Chicago. Hi, Gina. Hi, how are you? We're Great. so good. Happy to have you. <laughs> yes. And thank you for having me. Very exciting to be in New York from Chicago. Oh, oh yeah. it's great. So Gina is a physical therapist and a superstar, and I feel like that's understated. <laughs> she has presented over 100 lectures for coaches, parents, gyms, and athletes on various aspects of healthcare. co-wrote the only APTA-approved manual and course on performing arts medicine, has worked with numerous touring shows like Jersey Boy Chicago and Mary Poppins National Tour and in 2007 she started her own business Med Gym LLC. Locally she is a co-owner of Achieve Orthopedic Rehab Institute and provides physical therapy and movement analysis strength program creation, flexibility assessment, and sports-specific biomechanics education. Really, that's just not much. <laughs> it's incredible. It's incredible. It seems like a lot, but it's all in a day's work. <laughs> uh, so Gina is here today to discuss performers and flexibility. Let's go for it. Yes. So what does it mean to be flexible? How does a dancer's need for flexibility differ from a non-performer? It is a very hot topic in performing arts medicine. Um, it's a hot topic in the world just with runners and walkers and uh, the general public who is working out as well on what is flexibility. So um, medically, it is not only having the ability to achieve ranges of motion, um, but most people think of it as just muscle length and being able to touch your toes or being able to do an arch or bend backwards. Um, the aspects to it, I think, that deal with directly with physical therapy are uh, joint mobilization, um, having joints that move properly, um, and having the availability of that range of motion for muscles, making sure they're long enough to do what you want them to do. Otherwise, obviously, if you take them beyond that, they get quite angry with you, leading to sprains and tears and everything else. Um, and I think that's something that some people don't think about is that flexibility is also codependent on strength. So some people can be flexible when they lift their leg up, but if they're not strong enough to lift it as high as they need it, they're not ever going to achieve their flexibility. Um, so working with soft tissue structures and motion and joint health all leads to somebody being what we call flexible. Awesome. Um, so Okay, so arguably dancers need to be hypermobile or have a lot of flexibility um, in order to achieve optimal technique. So I think you kind of started answering this already, but is too much flexibility a bad thing and why would that be? Uh, it absolutely is um, as if you're not balanced with the strength and stability to support it. So in general, the body wants to be in two different modes of action, either stability mode or flexibility mode. So you either want to be mobile or stable. Um, oftentimes certain joints are meant for certain things. Obviously our elbows move and they bend because we're lifting things up and picking them up. Our spines in general are meant to be more stable as a, as a regular lay, lay human um, because we need to stand and walk and carry things and lift. So if we then convince parts of our body to be flexible, we also have to support it with the stability of joints around it. Um, otherwise leading yourselves to uh, more of a predisposition to an injury. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, so what types of injuries do you tend to see because of performers having too much flexibility? So in, in general, uh, ankles and spine. So uh, spine, flexi spine flexibility goes both directions. So if a spine is not as flexible it needs, as it needs to be and you start bending in ways that you really want to, your dance instructor needs you to, your musical theater director needs you to, you're now arching without an arch or you are going into port a bras for dance if you want to throw in some terms without knowing how to actually bend backwards, mm -hmm. it's going to cause something called, called hinging. Um, and I... Uh, copyrighted hinge theory in 2005 and it simply is the concept that the spine is like a slinky and every single level needs to take a little bit of the brunt of motion 
And if there's, uh, let's just say 20 parts to motion, there's more than that in the spine, but let's just say 20 for, for even purposes, and only three of them are doing the job, then they're doing too much of the work, therefore becoming overstressed and um, overworked and overtaxed. And to, to go one step further even, then you become tighter because you're protecting an area that is painful. If you are hypermobile, um, which a lot of people who get spondy category injuries, spine fractures often common in dance gymnastics and um, other forced arching sports like volleyball and, and offensive line of football, those bones become hypermobile and therefore the muscles around them sometimes aren't strong enough to keep you in a stability place and you end up slipping or the bones end up actually moving a little bit. So with too much flexibility, you really have to make sure you're countered by strength. And if you don't have enough flexibility, um, you need to apply some interventions either by yourself or from a medical professional to make sure that force is distributed to avoid injury. Um, that was a perfect segue, actually, into our next question, which is um, Great. what are some general <laughs> guidelines uh, a performer can follow in order to balance out uh, the hypermobility kind of needed for their sport? So um, if hypermobility is in one joint area and not in other joints, it's always a good idea to let the body even out and catch up, i.e. if you're per performing an arch or a back bend or any sort of, of um, arabesque position. Um, it needs to come from a combination of your shoulders, your upper back, your lower back, your hips. And if it's not coming from all of those, a hypermobile lower back does you more damage than it does good because you're not evenly distributed. Um, so what a performer can do in that case is make everything else kick up the brunt of the work. Um, the other thing that you can do if you need to increase mobility in general is A, stay away from things that I'm sorry, increase stability in general, is A, stay away from things that stress out your back, i.e., if you're a boy in a lifting combination in dance and you know that your spine is a little bit too hypermobile and your abs aren't quite there yet, lifting someone overhead in a one-arm lift is probably not a good idea mm -hmm. because you're not there to stabilize what's hypermobile and you may get injured. So um, evenly distributing the force and strengthening the local area are two very good ways to counter a natural hypermobility. Yeah, uh, you definitely filled in some holes that I had as a performer back in the day just now. That was so on point. Um, and there are many performers who retire and listen to lectures or interviews or read, and they think, wow, if I only knew that when I was going through this, obviously, which is one of your goals and mine, is to teach people about their bodies because yes, yeah. as a performer, you aren't just there during those eight hours or four hours or whatever to listen to your director or company manager you are your own body's boss and mm -hmm. in your off time you really do have to take care of yourself in order to last not only in the arts but also in life in general because of the extra stress oh you are just helping us with our questions <laughs> because this this is once again flows perfectly to what are healthy ways to maintain or gain flexibility so uh, I don't know if your next question may be unhealthy ways, but let's start with unhealthy, which answers some of the healthy ways. So the unhealthiest ways to gain flexibility are to demand of yourself to do it quickly. Mm -hmm. So A, either quickly on a daily basis, i.e. giving yourself five minutes, or B, thinking that you're going to get your center splits down in five days because you have an audition for chorus line. So doing things quickly actually makes for more hypertension in the muscles. Um, from a deep anatomy perspective, an HI wave overlap, and from a layman's perspective, when you're pushed into doing something you don't like to do, your body's going to tighten muscles and protect you from getting to that place that they knew stunk five seconds ago. Mm -hmm. So um, oft times when people are pushed down in splits, it's not healthy, but when you get to a point where you feel a little bit of stress and do it more consistently and continuously, the muscles actually let you apply the pressure and then they let you let go. And in letting that happen, there is a long lasting flexibility that comes from a restructuring of the muscle fibers. Let it go, let it go. Sorry. Absolutely. <laughs> Frozen 2018. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm just kind of thinking like this is a tortoise in the hare situation. Yes. <laughs> yes. So so the so the healthy way is patience mm -hmm. and the unhealthy way is pushing. And if I had a dollar for every person that I saw sat on someone in a pike stretch oh, or yeah. push oh. somebody down in a split, I would love to have them give me ten dollars later on when I told them that what they were doing was actually causing more harm than good. Mm -hmm. yeah. You'd have a really nice vacation lined oh, up. My God. 
absolutely <laughs> let's go <laughs> okay so we kind of want to talk a little bit about stretching um we know there are different kinds of stretches dynamic static prolonged ballistic etc so um yeah, and we know that you can employ all those different tactics in order to, to gain more flexibility. Absolutely. Um, and so we wanted to ask you at what time during your dancing or performing day should you use certain stretches? Is there a better time to use static stretches versus dynamic, et cetera? Sure. Um, there are a lot of people who think that they know the answer to this. So um, mine is based on uh, research and um, just anatomical structure. So um, here's kind of the stepping stone or the algorithm. Number one, you can't stretch when you're cold. So that eliminates two hours after practice and first thing in the morning. Number two, you want to be warm before you stretch, which means you have to warm up. I don't care if you do dance specific things, jumping jacks, uh, uh, dance dance revolution I don't care what you do but you got to get your heart rate up and, and blood flow to your muscles number three you can fake warming up if you're short on time by heating the area hot showers hot packs heating pads etc and then let's talk now about timing so static stretches are obviously done um, majority after or post workout um, as funny as it is, is that static stretching is what's going to eventually give you more length of your muscles, more what people consider flexibility or ability to touch their toes, ability to rotate or bend sideways, but it's best done after they work out. Nobody prevented an injury by pull it, from pulling a hamstring by stretching for two minutes before they worked out. There have been multiple research studies that actually show that the power that you can pull out of a muscle in a single jump height or a sprint or anything is lower after static because the, the muscles are too busy reorganizing fibers and not um, alert enough from like a brain talking to muscle perspective, a neuromuscular perspective, to call on those muscles to actually demand power production. So dynamic before because sports are dynamic. Mm -hmm. Dance is a sport. And dynamic motion cause, cause, uh, leads to needing dynamic warm-up. So if you're going to kick your leg into your head, and if you're going to arabesque or kick your leg backwards, you're going to need your muscles to understand that it's okay to stretch with velocity. And here's where flexibility and sport come in. So you can do yoga and you can be flexible static, and you can touch your toes in your room and be flexible static, but you can't touch your toes in a big pike jump, and you can't um, put your foot on your head in a switch ring leap, or you can't do an arch. If you haven't taught the opposite muscle which is the contracting muscle that has to actually release to be okay to release. Otherwise, it says, hey, silly, you're getting really close to our end range. And if you get any closer, you're going to fall off the cliff. So we're instead of letting you get to 98%, we're going to let you only get to 85 and then we're going to tighten because we don't think you're smart enough to stop. And that's called a muscle strain. Amen. Yes, amen. So static after <laughs> mm -hmm. when you're nice and warm. And by after, just like with protein supplementation, 20 minutes. It's got to be out. You can talk, but talk while stretching. Okay? Mm -hmm. Dynamic stretching beforehand, but it can't be cold. So everyone says, oh, I should static stretch before dynamic stretching to warm my muscles up. Wrong answer. Get warm first. Get blood flow first. Get your heart rate up second. Then dynamic stretch before you go through your dance warm-up. After you're done, static stretch helps with lymphatic drainage, recovery, blood flow, cell turnover, cell restructuring, and you get everybody at their weakest moment, right? Ask mom and dad to go to your friend's house at the end of the day when she's tired, not the beginning of the day when she's alert. So you want to make sure that you ask for that extra inch of hamstring flexibility when the hamstring is completely pooped out and doesn't want to fight you anymore. Yes, yes. <laughs> so um, going from there, we wanted to actually uh, focus on a specific flexibility scenario that we saw a lot when we were performing. So for instance, all right, in order to achieve a developé a la seconde, it is, is it sufficient to solely work on your flexibility into that position, or is there something in addition that you need to work on in order to achieve this? Oh, what a great question. We just did a lecture for a dance studio, a local dance studio, and they're trending some injuries for us, i.e., 10 and 11 year olds are having some hip issues, the 13 to 15s are having ankle issues, the 17 to 19s are having spine issues. And one of the things that they were talking about was that their youngsters are having some hip turnout problems. And the problem is, as we went and watched numerous, and this is, if you're, if you're in dance medicine, this is what you end up doing. You observe a lot, you take a lot of notes, you watch a lot of trends. Um, they stretch. 
and all they do is stretch. Mm -hmm. They don't, they don't do positional work. They don't do joint mobility work. And, um, so let me get into kind of the biomechanics behind attaining a position. So there are four aspects to attaining a position. Number one, your brain has to understand what whoever is verbally speaking to you wants you to do. Now that doesn't mean that the girl says yes. That means that she actually can put back to you, I need to work on my turnout. So I need to contract my glutes and open my hips. And by opening my hips, it means I have to get in this position, et cetera, right? So brain has to understand. Second, the muscle that's flexible or needs to be flexible. In this case, your internal hip rotators need to be flexible into external. Yep. Your hip flexors have to be flexible in order to open up and extend per se. Your, your spine has to be stable enough to allow counter pressure which is the third one, the muscle activation aspect of it, not muscle activation technique, but your personal activation, where whatever counter muscle to the flexibility is working has to understand how to be strong. And unfortunately, a lot of times glutes, and especially hip abductors and those that externally rotate, are some of the weakest muscles on dancers. And you ask why? Because we're quad monsters, right? Yep. So your brain has to work. The muscle has to be open to actually getting into that position. The strength side of the muscle or the opposite, the glute to the hip or the, the hip extensor to the hip flexor or whatever, the shoulder flexor to the extensor, the opposite has to be alive and working. And number four, the neurobiomechanic side has to work, i.e., many exercises have to be done mimicking this position to convince that at the same time when the glute works to open the hip up, that the hip works to allow to be open, i.e. you can lay on your back and do butterflies, very passive, gravitationally assisted. You can lay on your stomach and actually push your pelvis into the ground to, to strengthen, to stretch the front, but counter with balance. You can do a second a single leg um, turnout position into develop a against a wall and push counter pressure into the opposite muscles that are being used and then rotate your body away to convince those muscles to relax and let the other muscles work. Not to a point of cramping, but to a point of re-educating the muscles. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter how smart somebody is, how loud you are, how foreign your accent is, or how many times you say it. If you don't know what muscles to activate in your body, all you're doing every time you're activating a co a co-activation, not a co-contraction, co-activation meaning you're deactivating a muscle that's flex or stretched, right? Mm -hmm. And activating a muscle that works. You have to teach the brain that those things work together. Um, and if that happens, then you can strengthen in that manner. But, you know, what does the research say? Something has to be done 100,000 times for it to be wrote. Right. Well, I guarantee you kids have done it 100,000 times wrong and 10,000 times right. So the 100,000 wins if technique mm -hmm. isn't addressed from the very beginning. So there's a lot of work to undo first, right? Undo. A yeah. ton of work to undo. And to be honest with you, that's my favorite part of treating. And mm -hmm. I know that sounds so silly to start with the negative, but I'm such a positive person and I really try to tell these kids that sometimes on their initial evaluation, they're going to leave maybe not feeling too good about themselves. Mm -hmm. But if they already got to the level that they got to and they're, they're at this high level and they're having injuries and there's no reason why they're having injuries, that's a really bad answer in a bad day. Yep. But if I can tell you that the reason that you're having it is because of X, Y, Z and we can undo you and make it, it's a good day. It goes back to being a bad day when the mom says, can this be done by Monday? Right. And you say, well, if it took seven years to start, it's probably not going to take three days to undo. Mm -hmm. So um, I love working with those people because once the kids actually get it, they say, wow, I never knew that's what I was supposed to be contracting. No one ever touched that muscle. No one ever showed it to me. And if, and if instructors, with everything going on in the world, if you don't want to touch muscles, tell the kids to touch their own muscles to mm -hmm. activate them. Mm -hmm. But you have to be, you have to know what you're doing. And I love undoing problems. It's it's an amazing success to take someone and um, and undo a habit. To bounce off what you just asked, when kids are in the studio, they have their peers around them who are still doing the static stretching before and are, are not following the dynamic stretching. Do you find that to be something that could sometimes derail the switch from uh, proper treatment to everything funny that, that you, you Funny that you asked that. After you know 18 years of doing this, um, I will tell you that we take care of over 30 dance studios, and those are 
and not including our professional studios in the city and our traveling touring companies. And the local studios, there are only two in my history of working that I have not attained a full contract with after working with one dancer. And I'm not saying that egotistically or arrogantly because you can do it too. And by you, I mean you, Jenna and Marissa. And by you, I mean you dance instructors and PTs that are listening to this. If you can convince the studio, that the change that you're making in one will be better when the change that's made in one is made in all, you can convince them that it's their work that that they have to do, they're not going to do it. You convince them that you'll do the work for it, you'll provide them with the resources and everything, and you catch them at the right time, recreating and restructuring a program, being the medical manager for a facility, letting them understand the benefit and reaching the parents. The parents will push for you and it gets done. So I literally have treated two dancers in my entire career that didn't maybe stay on track because the rest of everybody didn't go through with it. Some studios that we have more looser relationships with, i.e. we're not on site five times a week, we're not doing treatment, we're not doing parent talks all the time, at least those instructors say send them with what they're doing for their program and I'll have the whole class do it. It's great for the teachers because it, it gets them off the hook for some time. And um, I think the hardest part is convincing them that as a dancer, only 50% of your time should be spent actually dancing. Mm -hmm. 25% should be spent doing um, flexibility, positioning, and strengthening. And 25% should be on biomechanics and technique, i.e. dance that's much lower than the level that you're at to maintain basics and repeated mobility. So I think the, the losing kids thing comes when there is a disconnect between the communication of the physiotherapist, the um, studio owner, the dance instructor, the parents, and the kid. And oftentimes, uh, from a HIPAA perspective, and if people don't know what that is, that's the Patient Privacy Act, um, we will make sure that all of our, our patients sign something that says that we can talk to anybody and everybody that we need to. And to be honest, although legally we don't have to dismiss them as a patient, if they say no, most of the time we end up sending them elsewhere because I don't believe in non-pervasive communication and when you communicate with everybody, um, A, the kids get better so much faster, B, the instructors learn. They didn't go to school to be a PT. PTs did. Mm -hmm. I didn't go to school to be a dance instructor. The instructors and the studio owners did. So if we all stay in our pods and play very well together, to, I mean, I, it sounds tacky, but together everyone accomplishes a great amount for these kids and getting the whole team on board is, is very important. We've even had We've even had groups say, I'll get there 15 minutes early if you do, and we're going to do the stretching program together so it doesn't even eat into the time of uh, studio time or, or point time or what have you. Oh, that's fabulous. You're even, you're even uh, la, la, you're creating a be better community as well, I yes. think, which is incredibly Absolutely. important in the dance And you want to make it, you know, these, these kids are used to being told what to do. You know, there, there are some sports like running, you know, no one's running with you. You go out and run by yourself and you have to put one foot in front of the other. And when you're playing baseball and you're out in the field, no one tells you to lift your left hand, rotate your arm and catch a ball. You do right. it by yourself. As a dancer, as a gymnast, as a performing artist, a figure skater, you're out there on your own. And you're, you're on your own in a group of people, but you're not making any of your own decisions. You're not plieing the way that you want to, tipping your head to the side wearing a purple leotard. Everyone's wearing the same thing. You look the same. You're doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times this independent thought process never comes about for these kids. And they view themselves as, um, as a team of people following a leader. And they need to, to view themselves on the fact that they can actually help themselves and their health on their own and when they understand what it means to turn out and when they understand developing in a really good position or an arabesque position or any I mean port a are fantastic to understand segmentally each individual level and how it moves they get empowered to actually think these things through on their own and and it shows in their performance awesome awesome okay so we're gonna move on a little bit yeah. and we are gonna ask you our favorite question. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so tell us your favorite story about treating a dancer. Oh my goodness. Um, well, I have, I have two actually, and I can make them both shorter cause they're both very meaningful in different ways. Mm -hmm. Um, I saw a dancer who had cancer and she was a kid and, uh, she found out that she had, uh, bone cancer and, um, it's very, very, interesting situation because at the same time that I had this gal, one of our studios impact here in Chicago had become a part of this national organization called dancers without cancer. And it's a, a goal to raise money and, um, and allow it. But the, the long story short of it is the physician actually had suggested to 
my patient specifically that as a dancer, she go back to dance to be part of her rehabilitation. And it was very scary for him because of bone density and, and rehabilitation and being nauseous and everything else. Um, as many physicians suggest to their normal people who are not dancers, mm-hmm. that they use dance as movement education, which is used for everything from cerebral palsy to um, abuse and neglected children, mental, physical disabilities. It's a fantastic way to teach the body motion, relaxation, storytelling, etc. So one of my favorite stories of her specifically was after she had her rod put in her femur and came back, um, she actually used used her motivation of dance to be more motivation to get to recital than she did to actually use it to to be part of her cancer treatment. And like I said, at Parallel, which was very funny, this organization that started, it's ironic, not funny, um, is that uh, Diane's studio was actually starting to raise money, and they had a dancer at their studio and her, the parents of this dancer said, you know, we really need to come back because she's missing this sport and it brings so much love to her life that, um, that obviously the, if, if you allow us to do this would be great. Um, my second story on the professional side, if there are professional dancers listening or if there's physios that treat um, professionally, um, one of my very good friends, um, and I will use his name because he's amazing, Brian Latandra, he was a Juilliard dancer, and um, he was a part of Mary Poppins. He was the statue in Mary Poppins, an absolute delight to watch, an art form beyond, um, one of my favorite p- human beings. And in the process of treating him through Mary Poppins, you realize that a well-oiled machine works when it's well-oiled, and a well-oiled machine when sitting in a car doesn't work as well. Mm-hmm. And um, it's actually less stress on the body to be at Juilliard and to be dancing and stretching and eating perfectly and in this controlled environment and being stronger than ever and do high-level performance than it is to do maybe a performance that's a little bit sub where your maximum qualities may take you, but also have the distractions of having to warm up on your own and having to maintain flexibility on your own when everybody else is doing tap numbers or stuff that's much less um, demanding. So the motivation internally from watching Brian and this did not come from my suggestions, this was all from him, this is more of an observation story, is that he put so much of his own time and effort into, outside of equity paid hours and all of the stuff that comes with with traveling Broadway theater, into making sure that when he did what he did on stage, which again is much below what he did at Juilliard, that he was able to stay healthy for the longevity of his musical theater career. Mm -hmm. So he took so much extra time warming up and cooling down. And even after doing... Um, audience talks would go back and do proper cool down and proper warm up and the discipline that that takes outside of a perfect environment is just absolutely amazing Um, and you know to watch that is is just art form you you realize how tender the human body is and once trained it can be untrained as quickly as it was trained and for him to keep up on all of those skills in a stressful environment was just uh, spectacular it is it is well thank you so much that concludes our segment for today. Thank you so much, Gina. You are very welcome, Marissa and Jenna. It was very nice to be able to share thoughts and ideas. And um, you know, I guess to all of you out there that love the arts, continue growing and supporting and you know, not just the people on stage, but we hope you realize all that goes into taking care of everyone in, in their adolescence all the way up to professional and keeping them on stage because it is truly it is truly a hundred hours spent for every hour on stage Mm -hmm. um so thank you to all for listening and if you ever go to chicago you know who to call uh we also want to thank you of course we also want to thank all of our listeners for joining us for another episode of physiotherapy performance perspectives join us on the first monday of every month for the next episode And of course, to hear more of our episodes, uh, click on the link in the description below to view our website. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com backslash PT Performance Perspectives to stay informed. And finally, if you want to get in touch, please email us at ptperformanceperspectives at gmail.com.